Section two of Oscar Wilde Art and Morality A Defence of the Picture of Dorian Gray Edited by Stuart Mason This Librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Martin Geeson Section two one of the results of the extraordinary tyranny of authority is that words are absolutely distorted from their proper and simple meaning and are used to express the obverse of their right signification a study in puppydom footnote st james's gazette june twenty fourth eighteen ninety time was it was in the seventies when we talked about mr oscar wilde time came it was in the eighties when he tried to write poetry and more adventurous we tried to read it time is when we had forgotten him or only remember him as the late editor of the woman's world a part for which he was singularly unfitted if we are to judge him by the work which he has been allowed to publish in lippincott's magazine and which messrs ward locke and company have not been ashamed to circulate in great britain not being curious in ordure and not wishing to offend the nostrils of decent persons we do not propose to analyse the picture of dorian gray that would be to advertise the developments of an esoteric prurience whether the treasury or the vigilance society will think it worth while to prosecute mr oscar wilde or messrs ward locke and company we do not know but on the whole we hope they will not the puzzle is that a young man of decent parts who enjoyed when he was at oxford the opportunity of associating with gentlemen should put his name such as it is to so stupid and vulgar a piece of work let nobody read it in the hope of finding witty paradox or racy wickedness the writer airs his cheap research among the garbage of the french decadent like any drivelling pedant and he bores you unmercifully with his prosy rigmaroles about the beauty of the body and the corruption of the soul the grammar is better than weeders the erudition equal but in every other respect we prefer the talented lady who broke off with pious apposio pieces when she touched upon the horrors which are described in the pages of suetonius and livy not to mention the yet worse infamies believed by many scholars to be accurately portrayed in the lost works of plutarch venus and nicodemus especially nicodemus let us take one peep at the young men in mr oscar wilde's story puppy number one is the painter of the picture of dorian gray puppy number two is the critic a courtesy lord skilled in all the knowledge of the egyptians and weary of all the sins and pleasures of london puppy number three is the original cultivated by puppy number one with a romantic friendship the puppies fall a-talking puppy number one about his art puppy number two about his sins and pleasures and the pleasures of sin and puppy number three about himself always about himself and generally about his face which is brainless and beautiful 
the puppies appear to fill up the intervals of talk by plucking daisies and playing with them and sometimes by drinking something with strawberry in it the youngest puppy is told that he is charming but he mustn't sit in the sun for fear of spoiling his complexion when he is rebuked for being a naughty wilful boy he makes a pretty moo this man of twenty this is how he is addressed by the blase puppy at their first meeting yes mr gray the gods have been good to you but what the gods give they quickly take away when your youth goes your beauty will go with it and then you will suddenly discover that there are no triumphs left for you time is jealous of you and wars against your lilies and roses you will become sallow and hollow-cheeked and dull-eyed you will suffer horribly why bless our souls haven't we read something of this kind somewhere in the classics yes of course we have but in what recondite author ah yes no yes it was in horace what an advantage it is to have received a classical education and how it will astonish the yankees but we must not forget our puppies who have probably occupied their time in lapping something with strawberry in it puppy number one the art puppy has been telling puppy number three the doll puppy how much he admires him what is the answer i am less to you than your ivory hermes or your silver fawn you will like them always how long will you like me till i have my first wrinkle i suppose i know now that when one loses one's good looks whatever they may be one loses everything i am jealous of the portrait you have painted of me why should it keep what i must lose oh if it was only the other way if the picture could only change and i could be always what i am now no sooner said than done the picture does change the original doesn't here's a situation for you theophile gautier could have made it romantic entrancing beautiful mr stevenson could have made it convincing humorous pathetic mr anstey could have made it screamingly funny it has been reserved for mr oscar wilde to make it dull and nasty the promising youth plunges into every kind of mean depravity and ends in being cut by fast women and vicious men he finishes with murder the new voluptuousness always leads up to blood shedding that is part of the cant the gore and gashes wherein mr rider haggard takes a chaste delight are the natural diet for a cultivated palate which is tired of mere licentiousness and every wickedness of filthiness committed by dorian gray is faithfully registered upon his face in the picture but his living features are undisturbed and unmarred by his inward vileness this is the story which mr oscar wilde has tried to tell a very lame story it is and very lamely it is told why has he told it there are two explanations and so far as we can see not more than two not to give pleasure to his readers the thing is too clumsy too tedious and alas that we should say it too stupid 
perhaps it was to shock his readers in order that they might cry fie upon him and talk about him much as mr grant allen recently tried in the universal review to arouse by a licentious theory of the sexual relations an attention which is refused to his popular chatter about other men's science are we then to suppose that mr oscar wilde has yielded to the craving for a notoriety which he once earned by talking fiddle-faddle about other men's art and sees his only chance of recalling it by making himself obvious at the cost of being obnoxious and by attracting the notice which the olfactory sense cannot refuse to the presence of certain self-asserting organisms that is an uncharitable hypothesis and we would gladly abandon it it may be suggested but is it more charitable that he derives pleasure from treating a subject merely because it is disgusting the phenomenon is not unknown in recent literature and it takes two forms in appearance widely separate in fact two branches from the same root a root which draws its life from malodorous putrefaction one development is found in the puritan prurience which produced tolstoy's kreutzer sonata and mr stead's famous outbursts that is odious enough and mischievous enough and it is rightly execrated because it is tainted with an hypocrisy not the less culpable because charitable persons may believe it to be unconscious but is it more odious or more mischievous than the frank paganism that is the word is it not which delights in dirtiness and confesses its delight still they are both chips from the same block the maiden tribute of modern babylon and the picture of dorian gray and both of them ought to be chucked into the fire not so much because they are dangerous and corrupt they are corrupt but not dangerous as because they are incurably silly written by simple poseurs whether they call themselves puritan or pagan who know nothing about the life which they affect to have explored and because they are mere catchpenny revelations of the non-existent which if they reveal anything at all are revelations only of the singularly unpleasant minds from which they emerge End of section two.